Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. It's so good, actually, just to be back at the forum. Uh, it's something I missed tremendously over COVID. We obviously did online forums, but it just wasn't the same. It's so much better to be in person and to be together. Um, so this is really our, our second forum in person um, that, that we've had since COVID. Yes. We had a couple last, last spring, too, but um, it, we have not gotten back to our, our full program. Um, art is an integral part of Grace Cathedral's mission to reimagine church with courage, joy, and wonder, and our vision for a more spiritually alive world. Art can connect us to others and also to ourselves in ways we can't imagine until we see it. Every year since 2012, we have offered a residency to an artist to create work illuminating our annual theme and to reimagine church as they do. This year, our artist in residence is the phenomenal New York and Paris-based artist Lee Mingwei. When we thought about this year's theme of connection, we immediately thought of Ming Wei. His work draws people in, it asks people to engage with the work and with each other. It is infused with ritual and beauty and is very much about the space and time in which it happens. Ming Wei began his career as a weaver and he sees his work in the context of warp and weave, relationship and connection. His work has been shown around the world, and in 2024, the de Young Museum is offering the first U.S. retrospective of his work. Today, we'll be talking about the connections between his personal story and his art. Mingwei, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a blessing to see you. Thank you, Malcolm. <laughs> yeah, we um, have been um, Mingwei's guest many times. <laughs> uh, he's, he, we, we've had dinner at your place in, in Paris, mm -hmm. and then we, we also had... Um, like a few times we got together. Yes, really. in London also. In London, yes. exactly. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was um, really great. I, I'm, you know, for people who, in the audience who may not have seen any of your work yet, yes. how would you describe your art? I knew that's coming. I know, I, I, I figured that was, it's, it's, a, it's a good one. <laughs> because often when I'm sitting in the airplane or traveling between countries, and the next person would say, so what do you do? And, and if I don't feel like talking to this person, I would be very naughty and I'll just say, you know, I'll, I'll pick a, art, uh, a project I do called a sleeping project. So I'll just say, I sleep with strangers. <laughs> that is a great answer. And then that either invite a very interesting conversation for the next two, three hours or just like, Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> uh, right, get back to this. Exactly, yes. So, um, to be serious, um, my type of work is probably un quite unusual. There are probably about 20 or less of the people like myself who does this kind of work. And it's under the rubric of um, um, performance. But really, for me, it's slightly, un, slightly different than performance because usually performance, there is a group of spectator watching and then there's a group of people who are doing it. Often my work involves the people who are watching to be a part of it in order to make the work much richer and more interesting because I always think of myself as being, not being a very interesting person and I really need uh, the participants personal history, personal idea, to come into the work and make it more interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's so many times when I, I try to, I say, oh, he's a performance artist, but not the kind that you think of from like Berkeley days. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, th there's a way in which um, what you do is, uh, it's almost the opposite. It's not like provoking or mm. upsetting or angering. It really is about connecting people. You're right, you're right, because um, most of you probably know that performance work started from the 60s and 50s. Even in Japan, the Gutai, uh, which is in response of the bombing of Hiroshima in World War II. Uh, and then later on, Joseph Boyce uh, in, sorry, I'm giving you a little bit of an art history here. <laughs> Joseph Boyce um, in response of the Vietnam War. So, and then later on in the early 21st century, we have Marina Abramovich. Uh, who does, who's really, you know, the, and Yoko Ono, who yeah. really paved the way of um, the kind of work I do. So my work now, it's more um, 
compared to them, it's less daring. <laughs> I'm very, very grateful of my predecessors and my mentor who, who basically trailed them. You know, pay, pave the way for me, and now I can do my work in a much more peaceful and truthful frame of mind. What I love, though, is that it's it's it is definitely peaceful and connecting. I mean, mm. it, it it humanizes us. Mm. And that's what I love so much about it, and it's why it's so deeply moving to me. Every project, um, but but there is this thing that you call the tension that's mm. in every project, and I wonder if you can talk about that because even though it's profoundly reassuring, yeah. there is this element of tension, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about you know how you conceptualize that and how you make that a part of of each project. Yes. The word tension that Malcolm just mentioned, I think it's really the spirit of all my work. Um, without this thing called tension, uh, my work would have seemed just like a, a pretty thing. There's nothing wrong about beautiful things. I, I love beautiful things. Uh, however, in terms of uh, being a creative person myself, I need to have something that is slightly unsettling, not in a way of so uncomfortable though, that you just don't want to have anything to do with this work. For example, um, just to give you an example, the tension I have created within a piece of work called Sonic Blossom. So this is a work that when you come to the Young Museum next year, someone in a costume will come up to you, a beautiful costume that I have designed, and ask you, may I give you a gift of song? Okay, so that's the tension. Because you could say, oh my God, I, I don't want this gift. Or yes, I would love to have this gift. Once you decide to receive this gift, or not, okay. So you, once you decide to receive this gift, gift, you sit down and the singer sing a beautiful Schubert lead just for you. And it's about three and a half minutes. So that tension again is when you're sitting here, the singer singing to you about seven feet away from you, while the whole museum watches the true um, kind of fluidity and communication between these two strangers. And often, I've seen it so many times, the receiver just start crying and sobbing within just a few seconds of this extremely powerful uh, tension there. So um, to be honest, if I see a work like that and someone invites me, I would just say, no, thank you, <laughs> and I'll run the other way. It's something odd about, you know, the person who creates a work, it's kind of, sh I'm, I'm very shy about this kind of um, uh, interaction. I was talking to a, a chef friend of mine, and he say he would never want to eat anything he cook in the restaurant. It's not because it's not good, it's just a different thing for him. You know, we, we watched the film The Gift last week mm. um, here at the cathedral, and I, I was moved to tears, but because when I see that, the, the woman in the very end who had the cane sitting in the chair, I, I mean, because we were, in a way, the, the film invited us to be that person mm. and to receive that You're gift. Right. Yes. It, it was a very, very powerful experience for, for us. We, we had mm. um, Robin, the filmmaker, yes. here. Yes, how and, wonderful. Um, it was great to talk to her afterwards. Yeah. Um, but I, I wonder if you can uh, talk a little bit about your, your mentors, Mm. And, 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 and who, because it, it's a wonderful invention. I think that's part of what it is, is that it, 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 it involves us. Mm. It's not like mm. we're a distant spectator. And I guess that's part of the reason why the, it worked in the film for me, because I felt like I was the person sitting in the chair. Ah. You know? um, but, but maybe you can talk a little bit about how you got this idea of, because it is a different thing to have an audience that, you know, when you're watching something, you're at a distance. Yeah. But instead to say something, well, will you come with me? I'm going to give you this gift. Sit in this chair. Yes. I mean, th that person becomes part of it. Yeah. I think it goes all the way back about uh, of me growing up in Taiwan in the early 1960s. Um, I remember sometime when, when I go to, I, I love to just travel by myself, even when I was eight or nine years old, I'll just meander along, along the villages and town. <laughs> Strange. But um, I would, often when I arrived in a new, new town, I would go to the breakfast um, place where they sell soy milk um, and uh, this pancake that made of sesame. And I'll be sitting there and just order something. And without failing, every single time, someone would come and sit in front of me and say, 
Hi, who are you? What are you doing here? Maybe because they saw a little kid who's eight years old just sitting there with a whole bunch of food <laughs> and just kind of staring at people. So um, the next thing I would know is that they would invite me into their house. And quickly I became a part of their community. And that really kind of changed my mind about how who I am in a new community and who I could be in a new community. And that really uh, became the seed of all my other works, uh, which is about opening up myself without any um, fear or um, prejudice, and therefore allowing the other people to come in and make me a part of their community. Yeah, and I think um, part of your nature as is, is being a relatively more introspective, mm. introverted person, I think it means that you do it in such an intentional way. Mm. And, I, and I think that's a, a really important part of it. Is that <laughs> I, I think many extroverts may not take the time to think about yeah. you know, how these things happen. Yeah. Um, and so they're less planned out. Mm. Mm. You know, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about like, like your experience of art as a child, too. <laughs> uh, you know, did you, was, what kind of art inspired you? Yeah. What was your experience of art, et cetera? Yeah. Um, in the early 1960s, Taiwan was relatively poor after the war. <clears throat> so a lot of family would um, wanted to have their kids to have the best education, not only sending them to Catholic schools, actually, um, and, uh, but also have us study an instrument, a Western instrument. So um, I started as a violinist, so continued to study until when I came here for high school. And um, that kind of prepared me to be someone who is well, who, someone who appreciates the Western classic. Um, and when I came to study uh, at Woodside Priory down South Bay, um, and that is when I encountered English, ancient Greek and Latin. And that was when <laughs> I had to suddenly study these three foreign languages, um, <laughs> besides from Taiwanese and Cantonese and Mandarin, um, and now French. Uh, so it's actually quite a beautiful experience and that made me, uh, um, I feel I'm a, a, a kind of a bicultural or tricultural person. I don't know if that answers yeah, that Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder too if you can talk a little bit about what your first impressions mm. of the Bay Area were and how's, <laughs> how's your impression of this region changed over time? Uh, when I first arrived, um, I, that was, um, I remember that was early, uh, early, late 1970. Um, I, I don't know, because I stayed in, in the campus because it was a dorm. Uh, I lived in a dorm, and I didn't really have much contact with the outside. However, I remember the brothers would take us to Grace Cathedral before Christmas and just gawk at the, um, decoration <laughs> and uh, and I remember the priest uh, the Benedictine priest will uh, drive their little rabbit um, uh, what is it called Volkswagen rabbit yeah. uh, and came over here and we'll, we'll just hang around and they'll took us, take us to the little cafe there were about six boys uh, and brother Christopher uh, and we'll, we'll just be here and I can't believe that years later I'm here sitting to you all um, and um, to be able to do the work. So to answer your question, the, the Bay Area hasn't really changed. I think it changed uh, in many ways, like all of us did, but still it is a, a home for me. And whenever I come back from Paris, from New York, or from Taiwan, I still feel very much at home. It's that sense of hospitality and, and the multiple ethnicity in this community is incredibly, inspiring um, after you know living in different parts of the world this is truly unique and to live in a harmony like this is is very inspiring yeah it's, it's I, I i love this place so mm -hmm. much um, mm -hmm. it's such a home for me yes. um you know uh we, we mentioned a little bit in the introduction that that you um, began as a weaver mm -hmm. and i may maybe you can talk a little bit about um weaving uh, we have these beautiful tapestries yeah. upstairs yeah. that yeah. are from the 16th century no one even looks at them they just walk by without realizing that you know 70 person hours mm -hmm. uh, uh, 70 Light, light, person years has mm -hmm. gone into the tiniest threads. I, I wonder if you can talk about weaving and then just its connection to your later projects. Yes. So I went to CCAC. Um, yeah. That's what it was called. So um, 
in a textile department. California College for the Arts and Crafts. Exactly. Um, it was an Oakland, San Francisco campus, but now I think the Oakland campus has kind of um, moved to San Francisco campus. I was there for four years, and one of my great mentors was um, Leah Cook, who was a great, great textile artist, American textile artist. I, um, I was the only male student in the whole department, um, and I often remember we would start, we'll study uh, ancient textile, including the Renaissance, including Inca, including Asian, and the structure of these textile. Um, and to be inspired. So, but of course, we were so far away from, from what they did. However, there are inspiration. And four years later, when I was applying for graduate school, I showed um, my other professors the portfolio I was going to send them, which are these images of the textile I've, I've woven. Um, and so uh, my mentor, Suzanne Lacey, said to me, she said, Mingwei, these are really great textiles and weaving that you've done. However, I can guarantee none of the school will accept you as a master program student um, if you apply. So I, at the time, I applied Cranbrook and Yale, blah, blah, blah. He said, because these are beautiful, but they're not conceptually strong. And if you want to be a conceptual artist, you need to spend a whole year for yourself and do something just for yourself and use those as a way of getting into these programs. And I'm very grateful that he said that, she said that to me. At the time, I was so heartbroken. Oh, yeah, so, just so disappointing. Like, like you, you didn't pass the test or something. Yeah, yeah but looking back, Malcolm, it's so funny. I, I, yesterday, I was looking at some of these um, weaving. They look like doormats, and um, <laughs> it was just so embarrassing. <laughs> and I just thought, oh, I spent six months weaving a doormat. You know, I can get a better ones than IKEA. But <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I spent a whole year doing three projects that already was had the idea of gift, uh, gift giving. And I see you have Louis High's book here, I The do. Gift, yeah. which was a book. And I still think is among a lot of students, it's a great inspiration talking about the role of an artist in a community. And basically, we are gift givers, and we are these people who receive the gift from somewhere, and we're not, we're not allowed to keep this gift inside. We need to share. Otherwise, it will spoil. Um, and um, so, yeah, so now I still consider myself as a weaver because these conceptual work, they are constructing a social web and warp. It connects people and build um, a more harmonious so society, uh, hopefully. You know, um, so so in that year, you you spent a, a year just focusing mm. on, on 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 your craft. Yes. And, and then, it, did you go to Yale after that? For, for um... mm. yes, I. So after, so basically, I spent a whole year doing doing already a kind of performance work without realizing it, yeah. um, because there wasn't a category for that. And then when I applied, yes, I got into all five five schools. I applied, and then I went to uh, Yale for the next two years under the program called Sculpture. And interestingly enough, Yale, uh, I think still is, uh, it's, although it's called Sculpture, but no one's actually doing real sculpture. We're all <laughs> crazy people doing silly things. So, <laughs> so that was the best two years in, in terms of academic years I have ever spent in my whole life. What, what did you learn there? And who, who were mm. some of the people you met? Good question. Um, what did I learn there? I learned that I need to understand where, I need to understand the art history, okay, intellectually. However, after that, emotionally, I need to be strong enough to be able to, to digest the art history and not to be afraid of what people did before and to just go, go forward. And also, the fact that we're, no one is original. No one is 100% original. We all is in the gratitude and grace of our predecessor who created these things, and therefore we can move one step forward. And hopefully that is, um, that, that's what I could do as a person, as an artist. So yeah, so two years there, we, um, I did this project called the Dining Project for the first year. And um, so, you know, 
relocating myself from the Bay Area to the East Coast is like moving from a country to another country. It is, right? it is. It's more you know, Pacific and that's more Atlantic in terms of cultural heritage. And I was a little bit lost living in New Haven. What I did was that I, I, I kind of went back to my, um, my childhood mode. So what I did was I put posters around campus in, in, within New Haven asking people, if you're hungry, just give me a call. And I will just prepare a single meal just for you. No one's watching, no one's, you don't have to pay, just come and please share your, 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 your story with me. So that's what I did for the first year. I had probably 48 different people and who will come more than once, uh, who will continue. And some of them became my li lifelong friends. And these people, including professor from you know, philosophy to janitors to homeless person who needed food. And that was the most gratifying experience I ever had. Yeah, I mean, it sounds fascinating. I'm, um, I wonder if you can talk about your fellow students and your teachers. <laughs> my fellow <laughs> students, um, they, one of my dear friend, Doho Su, who still creates this amazing installation and his work, um, basically it's about going back to um, Korea, that's where he's from, and um, create these um, installation that is made of um, very thin textile. And when you look at it, it looks like a great, um, palace hung in the middle of a room, uh, bigger than this, and it's almost like the skin of the palace. So he basically measured every single architectural detail of that palace and then made a, a skin for it. Um, and the other person who I remember very vividly, um, Janet Garner, she, um, she's, she's a brain she was a brain surgeon and got into the program. <laughs> And what she did was that she read, every two months she read a novel that was uh, part of the um, Nobel Prize. Um, oh, yeah. And then she will pick the female character in that novel and dress, she will make the costume and dress like that female costume, that person, and just walk around the campus as if that's the person for two months. And she would change from one culture to the other within next to me. I couldn't even recognize her when she changed. It was magnificent. Yeah. Yeah. So we're crazy. You know? <laughs> and my other friend who's um, Takashi, who was, um, uh, before he came to Yale, he was um, a tour bus guide in Tokyo. I'm like, you know, hello, this is Tokyo Tower. So, <laughs> but he creates the most beautiful and refined machine that creates bubbles. So when you look at these machines that he created, he worked with a, chemical, a chemistry department to create the solution. So when the, um, the bubble starts, it will be one bubble, and then two bubbles, four bubbles. So it's a, it's, it's a sort of crystallization of the water, and it, it's really quite amazing. So. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I certainly remember some characters from when I was in yeah. seminary. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and it was such a short period of time, but they, they really stayed with me. You know, yes. their idiosyncrasies, their interests. Yeah. I and mean, yeah. it was a very special time for when sure. When were you there, Mom? Um, so I was in, first went to seminary from 91 to 94. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember. Um, it's extraordinary people, people who are in charge. We had these like second career people who'd come back and they were in charge of churches yeah. that had yeah. thousands of people that could yeah. come to them. And um, people, my next door neighbor was from Nigeria and never oh, had lived goodness. anywhere else. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, uh, it, it pounded on my door the first night and says, if I'm, if I'm speaking in tongues too loudly, let me know. Because <laughs> you didn't, I mean, how, who knows that you're, when someone's speaking in tongues yeah. and bugging yeah. you, you should interrupt them. It's yeah. okay to do that. <laughs> Yeah, and then my professors were just you know, yeah. so memorable, yeah. too. This was a Div school in Prospect? Was it was it? at Harvard Divinity School. Yeah, Harvard. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and just watching their careers has been fascinating, Amazing. too, because yeah. they get involved in uh, journalism yeah, and yeah, politics yeah. and yeah. art, et cetera. Yeah. No, now, when you left Yale, maybe you can describe some of your early projects. I, mm -hmm. um, I, I know um, I, I, the, not just the dining project, but Money for Art, and, yes, and yes. then the uh, unnamed Hakama project. Yes, yeah. So, um, so that was the first year I did uh, when I was at Yale. And one day, my professor said, 
there's a gallerist who's coming to come see you. So stay in your, in your studio, uh, because Yale at that time, I think still is, a lot of galleries from um, New York uh, will come and look at the students and to discover Matthew Barney, Ronnie Horn, and Hamilton, um, all these people. So um, they, um, he said, you know, just stay. And I was so scared because I think, I still think my work doesn't have a commercial value to it. And to a gallery to come see the work, like what are they thinking? So, so that day I went swimming in the lake, stay out and then fish and swim. And, so, and, and then it was 7 p.m. I thought, okay, that person probably is gone. So I went back to my studio and the light was lit. So I turned on the, I went in there and my professor was furious with the gallery sitting there. And they've been waiting since three in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, it was a lovely conversation. And at the end, the lady, Jane Lombardon, said, you still have you know, one and a half years at Yale. Uh, why don't you, during Christmas holiday, why don't you write a proposal of what you could do in my gallery after you graduate? I'll, I'll offer you a summer show. Um, so I did, I did my homework, and then after Christmas, I just sort of sent her what I wanted to do. So that's where she said, yes, you got yourself a show. And ironically, I was the first graduate to get a show in a gallery. <laughs> you know, that creates nothing to sell. Yeah. Um, and because of that show, um, I don't know, Time Out at that time was the major um, critique, uh, besides from New York Times wrote and, uh, a review about my work, and the Whitney Museum director, David Ross, saw it, liked it, so he said, why don't you come in and talk to the curator at the Whitney about, about your work? So um, I went, and, and the thing is, that I, this is quite embarrassing, to be a graduate student at Yale and, and in the sculpture program, I have never ever been to the Whitney, and I, didn't, I, I just thought it's somewhere in New York. So I thought it was on, Park, but it's actually medicine at the time, oh, the Brow, yeah. Bro, uh, right? Yeah. So I was walking around, and it was three hours late, and I didn't have money to take the taxi, and, and suddenly I walked out of there all sweaty, and um, the director, David, goes, you know, you're four hours late. I said, yes. <laughs> and he, he said, what happened? So I told him what happened. He just laughed, almost fell off his chair. And he said, well, that was very original excuse. Okay, so come back, <laughs> come back. Uh, in a week, and we'll, we'll talk about, that. we'll continue this. So I did, went back, and an offer to do a project called the Letter Writing Project, oh, which is about project. writing letters to people who you never had the time and chance to say thank you, or I forgive you, or, you know, I, 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 for, I, I, I please forgive what I've done. Yeah. And then we send out the letters if you have the address. And that was my very first museum show. Which yeah, so, and, and so describe how it would yeah. be if you were to walk into the room. I mean, yes. there you'd be at a table, there'd yeah. be envelopes and very fine paper and yes, special yeah, pens. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so if you walk into the gallery, there are these three lantern-like booths in the space with um, paper and pencil and letter, paper letter, uh, paper, letter paper in there. So you're invited to go and write these letters that you didn't have time to write. But here you are, we, we have everything for even the stems. Um, so right, and then if you choose to leave the envelope open for other people to read, you're most welcome to do that. It is so, um, it's a very complex emotion because if you're reading someone that is so such an intimate story and that person allows you to read but you don't know who this person is, it's very, very um, beautiful and, and moving. So afterward, we sent it out to you and, and I had a very uh, unusual experience. So this was the first museum project commissioned, uh, 1998. And then about 10 years later, 2000, Eight. I was giving a lecture at Tate Modern, and I talked about the letter writing project. Yeah. Afterward, when I was uh, leaving the room, a young Asian woman came up to me with a child next to her, and she said, hi, I just wanted you to know I participate in the letter writing project. I said, where? Because that project has been shown in many different institutions. 
She said, oh, it was at the Whitney. I said, oh, oh how lovely. And she said, you know, I wrote a letter to my boyfriend at that time to ask him to please leave me alone and just let's terminate our friendship and this is not working. So she wrote the letter. And she said, you know, I, I, I put the um, letter in the, um, the slot for you to send it out, but the next day I called the curator for you to retrieve the letter, but you didn't. And I remember that, I just went, oh my God, because I do remember the curator called me and said, there's someone who put the letter that they didn't want it to just send it. And I said, like, yeah, I, I sent everything out, as I said. And, and I said, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't, you know. She said, no, not to worry about it because when my partner at that time received the letter, he was so moved. And we got married. And here's a child. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah! <laughs> it's, it's, so it's, the letter worked. <laughs> I think it worked, <laughs> and the child was standing there. <laughs> I love that story. I mean, I mean, I wonder if you can tell me the story about the, you know, the, the Back to the Singing Project, the, the oh, Sonic Blossom. Yes, yeah. Could you talk about that that in New York and the mm. woman from Germany? Yes, that was... I, I've been trying to tell people that story. Yeah. yeah. I remember the last time I told this in Sydney, I started crying, so yeah. bear with me if that happened, okay? <laughs> anyway, um, so this was... Uh, the Metropolitan invited me to do Sonic Blossom, uh, and it was the first collaboration between Asian and uh, contemporary department and performance department. So um, the location of this work was in the Great Buddha Room. I don't know if you know this room with Ming Dynasty mural in the back and the Tang Dynasty Buddha. So um, one of the singer um, was coming to the conclusion of that day after performing, performing, and then she noticed there was an elderly lady sitting quite far away from everything, but clearly was listening because she was there through from midday to the end of the day, but facing the other way. So um, she said, okay, I'm going to dedicate this last song to her. So she went up to her and said, may I give you a gift of song? And this, this lady turned around, clearly a little bit surprised. And she said, yes, um, but this is going to be a difficult experience for both of us. So Yongji, the singer, was a little bit taken back and said, OK, let's sit down. So Yongji turned around and started singing um, one of the Schubert lead. And this lady started crying, which is not unusual. But within about three or four measure, this lady put her head between her thumb and just started screaming so loud that we could not hear Yongji singing. And the, the, the guards running towards this place and everybody was watching. I, I swear there were probably 100 people just kind of yeah. staring this lady. And, but Yongji continued singing. She just didn't, yeah. So she continued singing. After three minutes, she went up to her and, and hugged her and said, I'm so sorry. This was so painful for you. So this lady looked, looked, you know, got up and um, kind of sat there and took a breath and say, that was the most beautiful, but the most awful gift I have ever received in my whole life. And uh, Yongji said, I'm, I'm just so sorry. She said, let me tell you why, because Yeah. So she said that um, her daughter was an opera singer, and um, she died in the little airplane that did a suicidal dive into the Alps. I don't know if you remember. This is about four or five years ago. And um, so during a funeral, all her friends sang this Schubert Lee for her because that was her favorite. Mm -hmm. And since then, she could never, ever listen to this song. She didn't dare to listen to this song until today. Somehow, Yongji chose that song out of blue, just sang it to her. And she said, I know my daughter is here, and these deities sing goodbye to yeah, me. Yeah. So, yeah. And she'd just woken up from Germany to yeah, fly, and exactly. she just uh, just arrived. So, I mean, even yeah. the chance that she would be there was so um, so extraordinary. Yeah. She. I later on, I, I went up to her, and she said, "I said, did you know about this work?" 
She said, no, I, one day I woke up and I just had the urge coming from Germany and bought a ticket and came here. I left my luggage in the hotel and I made a beeline into this hall without knowing why, as if someone's guiding me. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's something much bigger uh, I than, agree. Than I mean, us. when I preach, I mean, I know that every time I say anything, there's somebody who knows so much more about the thing that I talked about. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I'll find out. I mean, I talked about a professor at UC Berkeley, and seven of the, 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 the former students came and talked to me afterwards. Yeah, yeah. It, it is amazing, human beings, the way that we're connected and the way that yeah, we help each other. Exactly. You know, yeah. and, and how we're guided in, in ways that are yeah, so Yeah, we're mysterious. definitely kind of guided. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I... I really, every time when I think of her, I just hope that she finds the peace and, yeah. Yeah, that's part of her journey for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, you, you, you grew up in Taiwan, mm -hmm. you lived in Paris and New York and New Haven here, <laughs> London, Germany. Um, is there a difference in the way that um, different cultures and places like receive the gifts that you have to offer? No, luckily, no. <laughs> yeah. So there is something just basically human about it. Yes, I think um, my work is about what is it, like I say in the video, what is it to be a human being? And it, across culture, we all want grace and beauty. It doesn't matter if you're from Syria, from Taiwan, from China, you know, or from here. And um, there, there are little differences, but that's okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, when I did this, for example, again, Sonic Blossom in Japan or in Korea, n although people didn't understand the text, but the gesture of generosity is so powerful that we all know that because we're all human. And yeah, it's the same. It yeah, I love that. I wonder if, we, um, you know, the, in, uh, the American Academy of Religion has a whole department mm. on ritual. Mm. And, and I wonder what, what you have to say about ritual, because you, mm. you do construct these extraordinary rituals, and that's part of the power of it, is, is having a, an extraordinary opera singer be the sonic blossom mm. singer, uh, the, mm. the clothing and the gestures. One of my favorite parts of the film is you giving instructions. To the, <laughs> and, and basically you're talking to these fantastic musicians and just you're warning them. You're, yeah. you're going, they're going to turn you down. The yes. people are going to say no to you. And, exactly. And so you're kind of preparing them and helping them. Um, what do you have to teach us about ritual and how is, how is ritual an important part of human life and human experience? Mm. I think we all have our own personal rituals, like going to bed or eating or seeing a friend. And there are other types of ritual. There's, there are two different types of ritual. One is the personal one that we all know. The other one is the one that we had to study or learn from our community or from our spiritual practice from school. And um, the kind of work I do, it's more based on our quotidian ritual that you don't have to learn, really. I mean, you probably learn from your parents a little bit and family and culture, but mainly is to create your own ritual and, um, and, and, and see how this is a part of my work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you and I have had a little chance to talk about mm. um, just the effect of COVID um, is another thing that, that we're experiencing as a, as a species just around the world. Mm. Um, what do you think, um, like, what was your experience in COVID? And then what do you think that we learned in, in COVID, you know, across mm. all these different cultures? I think COVID um, is just one of the many, many challenges we had and we will have as human race. Uh, and we all learned from it. And it's, it's not even good or bad. It's just that's, that it came and we survived, um, some better than the other. But as a community, as a human race, as a race and species, I think we did relatively well. Um, and um, yeah, we all learn. And um, hopefully we're at the end of it. Um, most of the society are at the end of it. and. Um, We'll have other ones to come and, 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 and to deal with it. But don't worry too much about it. <laughs> Just live your day um, and, um, and be who you are, and we'll be fine, I think. Did, did you experience any kind of artistic breakthroughs? Or how did it? I mean, I can imagine, um, you know, being a, weaving tapestries and just weaving, a, having a chance to weave a lot more. Mm. I, I just wonder what it was like for you as you mm. were trying to um, develop and advance and progress your own art. Good question. So um, when I, I did a survey, European survey show at Gorpiasbau in Berlin, after we set up all 14 projects, 
the the whole city just shut down. This is 2020, yeah. March, yeah. So basically, these projects are like Sleeping Beauty to be waken up, and they did. They they did wake up in May when Berlin partially opened. However, the museum director also asked me, "What can we do in the meantime?" Um, they're all sleeping. <laughs> what can we yeah. do? So I I created a, pro a sister project from Sonic Blossom, and um, that project is done through Zoom. So basically, um, the singers. Because the singers, I, I still want them to be paid because I don't want them to suffer because of this thing, right? right? So I said, let's do something fun. So I came up with this idea that um, the museum will open up a, a kind of a, a appointment. You can make appointment online with the museum. And you don't know which singer you are going to get, but you know what, what time to lock into Zoom. So for example, you lock into your time frame, you open a Zoom. And then there is one singer across your computer. The, we had 12 singers. And some of them, it's interesting, because of Berlin locking down, a lot of them went back to their own country. So one was in Iceland, one was in Tokyo, one was in Taipei. So you know, just assume this person is in Iceland. And um, this person will sing a song just for you, but not one of the super lead. But it's a song about the arrival of dawn the hope, because to address the issue that we are in, in the depth of this very traumatic and terrible time, but hopefully something better will come. So that's what I did. Yeah, <laughs> that's great, that's great. So you even adjusted to learning yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. Even, yeah. even your art, which, is, which seems like the, the most distance from those technological, mm. but, but you were able to, get to, to yeah. make it possible still. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a, a, a tradition uh, at the forum. We take questions that are mm. written on cards. Of course. And yes. so if anyone has um, a cards with questions, that would be great. Um, you know, um, I, I had a bunch of questions that I, like, I could ask you questions for like days. <laughs> um, and so some of these are, are a little tough. But I, I wonder if you can talk about like, what, you, what you see as your, your greatest accomplishment. I mean, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest accomplishment. That I swim three times a week. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, you're still going miles and miles. Still going well, we miles also, and there's miles. There's plenty of time for, for you to, to think about that a little bit more, too. Yes. Oh my gosh, we have lots of questions. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, how would you like future generations to know about you and your artistic contributions? OK, that's an interesting one for me, because um, the work you're going to see here, uh, our labyrinth, it's actually acquired by Tate Modern um, a few years ago. And that was, um, that question has to do with this acquisition. Yeah, because every time when we get together for a meeting in terms of how to conserve this work, how to present this work, the curator always start ritualistic by saying, good morning, Mingwei. Imagining 100 years from now, someone's going to do this work. So tell us how you want this to be done. So that is um, kind of um, preparing myself and preparing the work to continue for the next 100 years. So I hope the work will continue, but it doesn't really have to be the way exactly I did it, because every time when I did this work, it's slightly different. So I'm not expecting anybody to just do exactly what I did. Um, so hopefully the essence will continue, which is the relationship between strangers uh, in a harmonious way, in a mutually respectful way. So that's the most important element in, in this thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, as you were thinking and talking, I was wondering about, I mean, just if any of your, if any of these rituals become incorporated into a kind of a religious life, a religious form, then, mm. then that would be a different thing too. Yeah, I would think so. I, I would think, um, Maybe when this work is presented in different culture, um, part of that culture's spiritual practice will embed. Oh, that's okay. That brings up to a, a different project I did in Queensland, which is the Bodhi Tree Project. Yeah. Um, so, for the commission of a new museum, the director asked me to do a project. So I said, I'm going to plant a tree. He said, Fabulous, just like Joseph Boyce did. It's slightly different. So, this is a tree that has the geological 
origin of the Bodhi tree that enlightened that witness and enlightenment of Buddha, which still exists in Sri Lanka. After five years, we brought this tree back and planted it in the ground of the museum. So if you go to Queensland Art Gallery of Modern Art, it's, she's there, she's huge, she's like three story tall. Long story short, so, um, so the curator every year will send me two things. One is the um, conservation department's, um, because it's part of their permanent collection, this living thing. And the other thing is actually a tree doctor report about how healthy this tree is. So, um, and then she also told me that the local community, it, they're not only the Buddhist, but all different spiritual practitioners, including the indigenous, uh, would come and dance, sing, and pray to the tree the way they wanted to, that relates to them which makes me so happy because it opens up to all different people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a great story. Um, there is no going anywhere else. I arrived out th that day in New Haven at 180 York Street as Frank Gehry was descending the stairs with a sculpture <laughs> student. I'd come to see Gary's student. I stuttered, Mr. Gary, he replied, come on with us that brilliant day. Please tell a story of a brilliant surprise of receiving, witnessing the gift of inspiration one time? Yes, lovely. That's a, that's, great a, that's a great question, very <laughs> original. <laughs> so um, uh, for my thesis project, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't come up with an idea. I, I kept thinking, oh, and I kept reading art history, blah, blah, blah. So I took a long nap in my studio. And I, in the, in the, in the, um, during my nap, I had a very strong vision of me as the performance artist sitting on the empire chair with half my head inside the ceiling. So uh, I was just sitting there like that, right? So I woke up and I went to my professor. I said, oh, I'm, this is what I'm gonna do. And he said, wow, good. Okay, why don't you go to the library now and look up Anne Hamilton's work? and you might get some ideas. I said, oh, I love Anne Hamilton. Um, so, I have all Anne, Anne Hamilton's um, uh, book there. And then I came across an image. She was sitting on the Empire chair with half of her head in the ceiling. No. <laughs> and the space where she did it was where I took the nap because she had the same <laughs> studio. <laughs> exactly, she had exactly the same studio where I was having my studio. This is. 25, uh, 15 years later or more. And I was so shocked because as if the information transmit through time and space and I didn't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and that studio also happened to be another great female artist, Ronnie Horn's studio. So Ronnie was one of my professor. She came and we talked. She doesn't have many words. She only speaks when it's important. And um, so, she pulled back the, um, the table and found these little snippet of, VD, of, of um, celluloid uh, oh, that yeah, she was- from film. Yeah, from films. Yeah. This is early 1980 or late 70s that she was a graduate student in that room, in that space. Um, so I'm very honored and so happy to be able to share that kind of space with great female, great American contemporary artists, Travani Horn and Han Hamilton. Uh, my um, dissertation came to me in a dream too. At yeah. like three o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I knew what I was going to do. Um, but yeah, it was, oh. it's amazing. It was a hot summer, July night, yeah. And, yeah. and that was how it came. Okay, um, did you think of starting your own school to introduce students to your journey and then inspire more interactive projects? <laughs> what a great idea. They are all very original ideas. Yeah. Um, no, because I don't think <laughs> I don't think I'm that. I don't think I have that big personality to start school. Um, and I'm a, the kind of person that is a little bit afraid of followers or <laughs> telling people what to do. <laughs> so having said that, um, institutions do invite me to go teach for two days. Um, for example, I will arrive uh, and then give a lecture of my work and then do graduate student master class uh, for each one of them the next day. So that's what I've been doing as a teacher, a professor or teaching 
for the past 15 years. Yeah, I think you have a lot to teach people about really engaging people in the work. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't imagine going to see a portrait artist and the portrait artist handing you a, a brush. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> or, or seeing a photographer and, yeah. and the photographer saying, "Here's, a, take a few pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Has studying classical music and, um, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. My eyesight's just... Mm. Used to be good before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Has studying classical music and um, ancient languages influenced mm. the development of your art or of your mm. artistic practice? Oh, that's a great question, too. Oh, I have to remember all these questions. They're so <laughs> beautiful and original and thoughtful. Um, yes, certainly. My favorite pastime is listening to Bach and Brahms and Handel. And then, um, and for reading, I love reading classical Chinese literature, uh, particularly from 10th century to 12th century. These are great minds. It's almost I'm conversing with great minds uh, through time uh, and through space. So they gave me enough space and inspiration to open up my mind to receive these ideas. So it's hugely important, and especially now learning French, I'm completely open to another part of European culture. Um, and that is so important as an artist or as a person uh, in the late 50s, still learning this great culture uh, and also literature and music and history. So it's, it's making me very happy. Yeah, oh, and I can imagine it'll have fantastic um, influences on your future work. Um, do you describe your art as storytelling, and how mm. so? Um, do you reference art as p p um, political or peaceful? Ah, okay, I'll answer the second question yeah. first. I personally don't think my work is political in the sense of in your face. Uh, and we do see a lot of brave souls out there when you go to Biennial's Documenta. Uh, these are amazing, tremendous artist work that is sort of bringing and amplifying what's happening uh, in, in our lifetime. I, I don't think I'm brave enough to do that. <laughs> so um, I, I, my work is political in the sense that it invites you to rethink about how you want to be as a person in, this re in, in relationship to your community and your, your life. So, um, so that's kind of political if you want to put it that way. What's the first? And the first question is um, storytelling. Yes, yeah, storytelling. Uh, I um, I love telling stories, and I love hearing stories. Usually, that's how I create my work. Besides from receiving these images from somewhere out there, I also will share some of these ideas, images with my dear friends who are close to me, and plant the seeds in their mind, and then probably six months later we'll have a conversation and, in a way, collaborating with them. So, and these are people who are great storytellers and they sometimes would just say something that's completely surprising and I wasn't expecting. And that's the beauty of it because all these people keeps the idea and then grow in their own way. And then at the end, the work is really collaborative in that sense. And then later on when the singer comes, there's another layer of collaboration and then the visitors, that's another layer of collaboration. So there are multiple layers of a community involvement in this work. Yeah, and things that you're not in control of. Are, mm, are, are completely. Can, yeah, I mean, they, they bring something to it that'll be surprising every time. Yes, yeah. Um, what kind of childhood in Taiwan and um, in, in, um, art practice or cultural practice um, that you continue to found later on at the, um, at, at the Asian tradition art you like to mention of? Mm. Um, Taiwan, I don't know how many of you have been to Taiwan. Um, until about 1985, it was a dictatorial state, uh, country. And then, luckily, we had this revolution, which is bloodless revolution, and then became a full democracy, one of the most democratic in the world. Um, and um, whenever I go back to Taiwan, I feel extremely lucky to be able to be connected with culturally both Chinese and Japanese because Taiwan was occupied by Japan for 50 years. 
And the culture has three very, well, actually four very important elements, which is probably like myself. First of all, the indigenous. There are 17 also Asian communities in Taiwan, which is the oldest. Um, and then the European, because the Dutch, the English, uh, the Portuguese were there, and then the Japanese, and then the Chinese. Um, so these four cultures really thrive harmoniously uh, within the community, and also, like myself, I'm partly Aboriginal and partly Japanese, so it's probably partly Dutch, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so it's a really mixed community, and that makes my work um, multifaceted. And um, it's not about particularly about being Taiwanese, whatever that means, I don't, I don't really know. But again, what is it to be a human being? Yeah, that's great. How important is the narrative aspect of your work on the, um, the viewer or the spectator? The narrative aspect of my work. Narrative in terms of my narrative or? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So, so, uh -huh. The spectator uh -huh. narrative. It is very important because I hope, I hope the work is open enough that you're able to put your own narrative into it. And, um, and it's not about what does Mingwei think about this or how, what does Mingwei want out of it. I don't want anything out of it. I want you, if there's something I want you to do is to, to be slightly changed before you enter, I mean, after you enter the museum and experience my work. And that change is not about better or worse. It's more about, wow, there are these possibilities and, or even with questions. So that makes you, uh, uh, wanted to be even more curious about life, about who you are, about the things that is around us. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of the, of the labyrinth, the way people walk labyrinths. Oh. They, they're, they often, they, they may have a guiding question as they mm. enter, they may not, but yeah. it, there is something that happens mm. as, they, as they do Completely. that. Completely, yes. um, What drew, drew you to Paris, and have you encountered communities where you did not feel you could enter easily? Mm. Okay, what, so 2000, let me see, 2015, uh, my husband and I were living in New York, and he was working for a French firm called AXA um, in the finance dis department. So um, one day he came back and said, tell me two cities you would like to live in besides New York, you know, Taipei. And I said, well, Paris and Tokyo. And he said, well, we're going to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so, voila. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> Three months later, I was, I was in, uh, in the Septième Amdisson in, in, in Paris, and I didn't speak French. I studied Italian and Spanish, so French wasn't that foreign for me. Um, and um, it was an eye-opening experience, and I, I'm still loving it. Um, and I, when people, before that, when people say, you know, I'm a Fran Francophile, I just thought, Francophone. I just thought, why, why are you a Francophile? But now I kind of understand because it's a very complex uh, culture, uh, like any society, but this one is really quite, quite interesting. And, and everywhere I walk is full of beauty uh, in the most glorious way. Yeah, it's uh, something so moving to see people put such attention and thought in everything, in the buildings, in the clothing, the food, uh, even the way they talk, the way they use the language. So I was invited to do a new work for the 2017 Venice Biennale. So I did a project called When Beauty Visits, and that was completely inspired by living in, in Paris. Uh, and um, that's when beauty visits me in the most powerful way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what has been your experience with Lewis Hyde? I mean, I, I know that he's been interested mm. in your work. I mean, mm. um, what, 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 is, what, what does he say about the things that you do? He, um, I went to teach his class several times, and um, I think he appreciates what I do. Yeah. And um, we actually don't, didn't really have much conversation about what he does or what I do, just yeah. because we know that mutually we inspire each other. Yeah. So I will see him uh, next time when I go back to Boston and uh, have lunch together, and that's what we, it's our ritual. We yeah, just have great. a lunch together, glass of wine, and yeah. just talk about things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. 
Um, we, I, it, it's impossible for me to realize, but we're actually out of time. Oh, I mean, it just went by so quickly. <laughs> um, but I wonder, just as we're wrapping things up, if, if you can just describe some signs of hope that you see um, as you look around the scene these days. Mm. <laughs> Wow, the airplane's all full now. Oh, yeah. It's definitely <laughs> it's a crowded sign. again. <laughs> um, because I was just in Paris uh, last week, um, and um, the city is completely back and in full, full throttle, even more. I was in uh, Aubert Gagné, and every seat was taken. It was Tosca, tragedy, but absolutely beautiful. And I noticed something unusual, well, not unusual, but because when people went to opera, they do dress up. But this time, when I went there, so many opulently dressed people just show up with flower in their head. And you could feel that people are finally back and celebrating this something very precious, which is about creativity, about community, that we're all in this together. So. Uh, there's a lot of champagne flowing around, <laughs> people laughing so loud. Usually, French don't do that, but this is like, oh, peace, peace, peace. <laughs> and, and someone actually bought my husband and myself to champagne uh, just to celebrate, and it's really so moving. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. I, and you're part of how we're coming back, and we're a little Thank bit slower you. in coming back. <laughs> <laughs> But you'll have uh, many more opportunities to see uh, Ming Wei uh, this week. Uh, mm -hmm. And then next Saturday at noon is when um, he'll be doing Our Labyrinth at mm -hmm. Grace. And we're, we're so excited about that and you know all the other, other things that you're doing for us. Thank you, Malcolm. Yeah. Yeah. And so happy to be back again. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Please join us next Sunday when Ming Wei will be joined by the three Our Labyrinth dancers to talk about the creation of the work, what it feels like to perform it, and how the work has evolved over time and space. You're very welcome to join us at the 11 o'clock service for the Choral Eucharist upstairs in the cathedral. We rely on your gift for the forum. Gifts of any size make a difference. You can place a gift in the donation box or you can give um, at gracecathedral.org or by texting THINK, T-H-I-N-K, to 76278. Again, thanks so much, Ming Wei. Mm. We're so grateful to have you. What a great Thank day. Thank you. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. That was perfect.